which was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men, who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Good morning. What a joy to be together. In 1797, on the 4th of March, an event happened which was, I guess historians say, unique in history. A major center of power was transferred willingly from one man to another. March 4th, 1797, a man who sat in a seat of power gave all of his control and power to somebody who wasn't a family member. This wasn't a line of secession where your son or daughter takes over your position. He didn't give it to a foreign conqueror, willingly or unwillingly. He didn't give it as a backroom deal to gain prestige or money or power of his own. If you haven't guessed, it's the transfer of the presidency of the United States for the first time from George Washington to John Adams. Two men who disagreed strongly about how to run this brand new country. You know, some punctuations just have a message all to themselves. I don't even know what that means. The trick is to keep your Uh, point where you were. (laughs) It really was an amazing event. George Washington gave to a a political, uh, John Adams wasn't his enemy, but he wasn't his ally. John Adams and Thomas Jefferson and Washington, Washington was more neutral than most of them, but felt strongly about certain things. Benjamin Franklin, James Madison, Hamilton, these men in many things disagreed strongly, vehemently about things. That's why Hamilton got shot, you know. This this was powerful stuff. And yet, he transferred his control of this brand new country, partially based on his desire just to go home. He tired. But he had made a promise. It's similar to the promise that many of you have made. He had risen, raised his right hand, and I don't remember at what point he was uh, connecting himself with a, a Bible, but presidents being inaugurated have laid their hand on a Bible or done other things similar to that. And said, I do solemnly swear to faithfully execute the office of the president's, president of the United States and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. Now, some of you men and women have done the same thing without the president part. I do solemnly swear to fort and suspend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear truth, faith, and allegiance to the same. I will obey the orders of the President of the United States and the orders of the officers appointed over me according to the regulations of the Uniform Code of Military Justice. So help me God. 
I, when I first said that oath, my father was reading the oath to me. That was really cool. That was fun. Carol was there. We weren't married yet. We had just gotten to know each other a bit. And I was too fumbling to be thinking about what those words were. But later on, as I said it the next time and at other times, and then when I said it in front of other people, and to this past season, I've been wondering, why do we say that? As a, as a military member, which is, of course, how I and most of you have done this, or most of you have said this, uh, oath have done it, aren't we defending our country? Aren't we people who defend the United States of America, you know, our land? Aren't we defending our people? Don't I say I want to defend my family? Don't I say I want to defend my society, my nation, my... No. It says, and I said, without knowing what I was saying, I will support and defend the Constitution. The Constitution against all enemies, outside and inside. And I thought of odd scenarios where we had to set up a perimeter around the National Archive building. They're attacking the Constitution. Lay down protective fire. Which, of course, was absurd, because you could, you could bring the National Archive building down to ashes, and you'd still have a Constitution. Which I, I, I was just playing with my thoughts. But here George Washington passed off the power of leading this country to to somebody who disagreed with him, who wasn't related to him, who hadn't threatened him, because he was in defense of a document. More than that, in defense of an idea. Why? Why are we sworn to defend the Constitution? It's going to happen this January, this month. Why are we sworn to defend the Constitution and not the nation. Think about that. If, if Washington or anybody else had been sworn to defend the nation and had come to the conclusion that the best defense for the nation was that he take continue in power, he would say, I'm fulfilling my oath. And I will not let that man take power of the presidency. I will keep it. I control the army, and the army was very loyal to him. I control most of the states, and most of the states were very loyal to him. And we'd have had a mess, and we wouldn't have a country anymore. Where does that oath come from? It comes from, I didn't know this, Article 2, Section 1, Clause 8 of the Constitution. The Constitution says that the president is established on someone who will stand and give this oath if he's selected or she's selected in this process. In other words, you can't be in the position, according to the Constitution, without promising you'll defend the document itself. We stand in a similar place, which is, of course, why I bring it up. Because if you say, I'm going to defend the nation, then you can morph that into whatever sort of thing you want that looks or sounds like a nation and say, I'm fulfilling my oath. Obviously, people disagree over the meaning of the Constitution, but you can't disagree over the words or the clarity of it. It says we'll have this kind of executive branch and we'll have this kind of legislative branch and we'll have this kind of judicial branch. It says the states will have these powers and the federal government will have these powers. It says you'll have these freedoms and these are established by a higher power than our country, but these are established by our country within our country, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You can't disagree 
with the words. In studying this idea, I began to wonder if we would even have a country except for that oath. I began wondering if we could morph your promise to the country in whatever shape you wanted to with the, the, the tearing apart our country with the Civil War and the other just awful things that have happened in our country with all sorts of divisive and, and, and damaging things going on and disagreements. If we had had men and women who had promised to defend their own idea of what the country ought to have or what the country needed rather than the document itself, I'm not even sure we'd have a country. I'm not sure. It's an interesting question. These men and women are asked to defend the idea, the document that shapes our country. Because when all of the things go sour and people disagree and all sorts of mess gets thrown up and thrown down, everybody stands there and they're still looking at the Constitution and the Constitution says, you're gonna have a president, you're gonna have a legislative branch and you're gonna have a judicial branch and you're gonna have states that agree on these principles and we're moving on. And you breathe in and you breathe out and you move on. It's happened over and over and over again. We just read, we just read in Jude a similar kind of oath. By the way, the phrase, uh, I do solemnly swear or affirm, that parentheses comment was put in there because of the Christian faith. Because Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, said, do not swear. And so when the document and these uh, affirmations were written down as, I swear, there are all sorts of objections going up around the room, said, we're, we can't swear by, because of our faith. Can you affirm to something? Yeah, I can affirm to something. Okay, that's fine. Now what you should do, if you're ever leading somebody in the oath, Ask them beforehand, which word do they want? And then just give them that word. So even that is, a, is an acknowledgement. And of course, that's not literally what Christ is talking about. He's talking about uh, making promises more uh, uh, committed because you make it something you swear to rather than but as any oath we take. We don't need to add to it any words. We say something is so in our lives, and we're going to work to make it so. But in Jude, verse 3, Beloved, while I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you appearing, appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith. The faith. Pay attention to the details in scriptures. And one of the details to pay attention to is the, is the definite article, the. This isn't a faith. This isn't even faith. Faith is what somebody believes, and there's many different beliefs around the world. A faith is pulling one of those out and looking at it. He's talking about the faith, which, of course, is very specific because this is the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints. For certain persons have crept in unnoticed, those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation, ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness and even deny our only master and Lord, Jesus Christ. The words are a bit different, but you could even hear Jude saying, raise your hand, those of you reading my letter, that you will protect and defend the faith against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Not the idea of faith, not your faith, 
Because just like our country, your idea of what this country ought to be like and the Constitution may not line up. My idea of what faith in Christ is and the faith may or may not line up. He's talking about defending the faith. There's a really neat uh, verse in um, Proverbs. I'd like you to turn there. Many of Proverbs are written as individual lines, uh, two-part lines of pieces of truth and things uh, about God and, and life that we can hang on to. But Proverbs 23, similar to, to the first few chapters of Proverbs, Proverbs 23 gets into a bit of a dialogue. I shouldn't say dialogue, it's a monologue because it's a parent talking to the child. And, and children in here, you know how parents are. They go on and on and on. So this is a little bit of that, except better than what I say to my children anyway. So Proverbs 23, starting in verse 15. My son, if your heart is wise, my own heart will also be glad. And my inmost being will rejoice. When your lips speak what is right, do not let your heart envy sinners. Well, there's a lot in that. Do not let your heart, well, I wish I could do what they're doing. Do not let your heart envy sinners. But live in the fear of the Lord always. Surely there is a future. And your hope will not be cut off. Listen, my son, and be wise. And direct your heart in the way. Do not be with heavy drinkers of wine or with gluttonous eaters of meat. For the heavy drinker and the glutton will come to poverty. And drowsiness will clothe one with rags. Listen to your father who begot you. And do not despise your mother when she is old. Buy truth and do not sell it. Get wisdom and instruction and understanding. Buy truth and do not sell it. We just finished a holiday season, and many of you were probably like me. You were thinking about something to buy for somebody, and that price looked like too much. I, I don't want to spend that much on it. I wonder if I can find his, oh, there's a discount place. I'll go over there. Oh, they don't have the right one. Well, I'll look it up on, oh, look, online. I can get it for $10 cheaper with $10 shipping. Well, that doesn't help me a lot. And so we keep looking for the bargains and looking for the bargains, and we talk to our friends, and, oh, I got a half price. Do you really? Can I have the coupon? I said, yeah. We're looking for bargains. We're looking to spend as little as we can to get the neatest thing we can. Don't do that with truth. When you find the truth, like the guy in Matthew 13, the parable Jesus taught about the, the guy who finds a treasure in the field or the merchant looking for the pearl, goes home, each one of them sells everything they have to buy that one thing. When you find the truth, you pay whatever it is to get it. You don't put a price to sell it. You see, if we're not hanging on to the faith which was passed down in Christ and of Christ and on Christ and through Christ, we're not going to have his church. If we're looking for a discount, for something that's easier on me, for something I don't have to really commit to, for something that's easier or more popular, or, or why do we have to make a point about this thing anyway? It doesn't really matter. You know, we don't need the legislative branch. The Congress just messes things up. How about we get rid of that group? If we're just going to morph this thing into whatever we want it to be, then why have a Bible? Why have a word? Why have the death of Christ on the cross at all? If we can have any faith in any pattern in any direction, but we're told to find truth and cling to it, no matter what somebody offers you for it. 
You cling to it. You cling to it. John 17, Jesus is in his prayer. In John 17, Jesus is praying about us, first about the apostles and then about us. And in verse 13, he says, but now I come to you. Jesus says to God, I'm coming to you. And we know what that means now because we've seen the cross and the fact that shortly after the cross, he returned to heaven. But those hearing that prayer then wouldn't have known that. But I come to you, and these things I speak in the world that they may have, these things I speak in the world so that they may have my joy made full in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world even as I am not of the world. I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have also sent them into the world. For their sakes I sanctify myself, that they themselves also may be sanctified in truth. The disciples were used to Jesus talking about the importance of truth. Here he's specific about the truth. Similarly, in, in, in Romans 1, when Paul writes about the truth, he talks about, in Romans 1, uh, verse, what is it, uh, uh, of 8, he praises the Romans for your faith. He says, your faith is something I want to tell people about. I have, uh, I, I have proclaimed to many others about how strong the faith, your faith is in Rome. And he's talking about their own faith, how their faith is obedient to the faith. And then he goes on and talks about the truth and how they have, the world has sold the truth in exchange for a lie. For, excuse me, sold the truth in exchange for the lie. Both of those words in that, uh, in that part of Romans 1 have the article the. They have exchanged the truth of God for the lie. Some people had the truth and they decided when somebody offered them the lie as a price to pay for it, they said, sounds good to me. Something about the lie made it easier, more convenient, more friendly, whatever. But the apostles had heard Christ teach these words in Romans, excuse me, in John 8. So Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed him, if you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. If we don't hang on to the idea the word. Similarly to our country not hanging on to the Constitution. The, the country has gone through horrible things. And it's a rough time now, a, a bit. Not as horrible as some things in the past. But we have a rough time now. But if we hang on to the idea and hang on to the truth of what that idea means, we'll have a country on the other side of this thing. When we give up on that... I don't know what we're having. When we hang on to the truth, as Jesus said, which is the word, we're going to have a church. When we're submissive and, and determined that God's word will guide us as a truth, we can have his church. When we say, well, I don't know about all that word because some of it was written by people who da 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 and we get qualifiers and explainers and deleters and all sorts of things going on, I don't know what you're going to have after that. 
but it's not going to look like, eventually, it's not going to look like the Lord's church. Hang on to the truth. Be devoted to the truth. Love the truth. Love the word of God. It's a glorious thing. It is a rejoicing thing. It is what illuminates our way. Right? Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light from my path. What a great thing to have. That when it gets rocky, and we're not going through a rocky time as a church, at least not here, uh, the church is always challenged. I'm not talking about any particular problem. I'm just talking about the idea that we grab onto it and we don't let go for any price. We stay humble before it because we want to understand it. People disagree about what the Constitution means. People disagree about what the Word means. But you can continue to study it and look at it and and. and and analyze it and submit yourself to it, and Christ promises that you can know his truth. And as long as you don't give up on trusting and following the word, you can stand strong. What a great place to be. What a great place to be. What a rejoicing place to be, but in the truth of his word. And and the truth will make you, what? Free. Free. Free, free, free. A little boy once had said, the truth will make you three. That was nice. He was three at the time. The truth will make you free. Something solid to stand on. All about the love of God, all about the family of God, as Gary has explained to us this morning, all about being in a deep and a, close, and a personal relationship with God, a committed eternity with God, a joyous place, a forgiving place, a, 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 a place of, of unity, a place where people care about each other, all because we're determined to know the truth. Not we're determined to be right, Now, we're determined to to stamp our foot and tell other people what the Bible means, but we're determined to know and follow and love God's truth, God's word. If there's any here this morning who have never been baptized into Christ, it's explained in his word. If there's any here this morning who are hurting in their own family, uh, in their own lives, uh, whatever it is, we have a time in which you can come forward and, and spell out where your needs are. We can pray together. We can study together. If you're ready to come to Christ, we can help that happen today. But let us be devoted to God's word. Let us always be a people who support and defend the word of God against all enemies inside and outside the church that we can know and have his word always before us. Come forward while we stand and sing the song. It's like oh, what a wonderful, wonderful day, day that I will never forget. After I'd wandered in darkness away, Jesus, my Savior, I met. Oh, what a tender, compassionate friend. He met the need of my heart. Shadows dispelling with joy, I am telling he made all darkness in part. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole, my sins were washed away and my night was turned to day. Spirit is life from above into God's family divine. Justified fully through Calvary's love, oh, what I'm sending is mine. And the transaction so quickly was made 
When as a sinner I came, took of the offer of grace he did proffer, he saved me, oh, praise his dear name. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me My sins were washed away, and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down, and glory filled my soul. Now I've a hope that will surely endure after the passing of time. I have a future in heaven for sure, there in those mansions sublime. And it's because of that wonderful day, when at the cross I believed. Riches eternal and blessings supernal, from his precious hand I received. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole, my sins were washed away and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Please be seated and we'll have our closing prayer. Pray with me. God, you are an awesome God. Our creator, the beginning, Father. You created us in your image, and we are so blessed by that. Father, as we, we come to you, we, we can't express enough the comfort and the, and the joy that we have knowing that, that you have truly blessed us. For those, there are those who are in the world that cannot even imagine the way we live our lives. But not only materially, by sending your son who, who gave us that truth for, for free if we'll accept it, Father. Don't let us buy into the, the lies or, or the lie because it's so cheaply done. For we know that, that that is a very expensive price that we'll be paying for that, Father. And we thank you for the truth. Father, as, as, we've, as we've learned here today and as we've worshiped you, help us to defend that truth as Robert so eloquently focused our minds during the lesson. Help us to, to study the truth and to study your word. Father, we're so thankful for the family that we have here, as, as Gary had talked about during his focus on the communion. Help us to, to be a part of the family here, to support one another. But then again, to look to you as, as our Father, to look for that advice when we need it in your word. Help us to, to take that and to to be an encouragement to one another, but to also those that we work with and those we go to school with and where we make him in contact with, Father. We thank you for that. We thank you for our health that we have, but we also have those that are among the family here that, that need your help. We play, pray for uh, little Fletcher as, as he continues to go through the tests and, and possible surgeries that, that uh, he'll need. That you'll be with him and the family and those who 
work over him as far as the medical uh, procedures and, and recommendations and advice. But we know that you have the healing power of all. Father, we, we pray for, for Jason Gardner's sister, Julie, and her husband, Tony, as they try to make decisions on, on their life and, and what they should do. Father, as we, we meet over here in the, uh, in the hall here shortly for the food that you provided for us, because we know that you provide everything, help us to appreciate that and, and the work and, and the love that goes into that. And we ask that you bless it to help us to give us energy to continue to do your will. We pray that, that all those that can be here uh, Wednesdays and, and Sundays and next week, the appointed time that we can be here, but we, we come to you often. We pray for that wisdom to do that. Father, we, we thank you for all these things. It's your son's name that we pray. Amen. Good morning. I'd like to welcome family and all the visitors for coming here this morning, taking the priority in your lives to be a part of the worship, worshiping God with our brothers and sisters. Hopefully I can put this all together so it'll be easy to understand. Um, like was mentioned in the prayers, we do have several who need our prayers um, for medical reasons. Um, Scott has a friend who, he lives in Oklahoma and he's hoping to come to Anchorage. He's gonna have an interview for a job and, he, and his name is Blake Reynolds. And Scott asked us to pray for him um, for his interview so that he can move up to Alaska. And uh, as Tim mentioned, Fletcher uh, had an MRI this week. Um, and they found a growth. And they're hoping uh, that uh, things will go well with that. It possibly may be growing and, and may have to have surgery if it starts growing rapidly. Um, there's... Maggie Kofsted's son, his medical issues. Um, Scott Crockett's uh, friend um, who is in hospice care. Greg Neeson with his cancer. Marie Elnan um, recovering from her surgery. Marilyn Dvorak, uh, Wendy's mother who's recovering from her knee surgery. Um, we'll pray for those who are pregnant. Autumn and Collins and Lindsay Teamer and hope they'll have a good pregnancy and good delivery. Um, there's those who are traveling. The Crockett um, family is gonna be traveling to see their family. Mike Kakis is going to be leaving the 11th for Thailand with uh, Steve Cannon. Um, they're going to just uh, see how uh, Lauren is doing um, with his mission work to maybe help him out and, see how things are going with that. There's several activities going on. There's a ladies ministry meeting uh, January 10th at 7 p.m. Uh, here at the building. They'll be making cards um, for fellowships and welcoming uh, other children. It's also a, a card making for everybody, I guess. Friday and Saturday the 13th and 14th and bring a lunch for that, that'll be at 10 a.m., 10 to 2. Aunt and Kim Delph are going to be doing uh, pictures for the directory and also just family uh, portrait picture, pictures. That will be this today and next Saturday and Sunday, so get with them to schedule those uh, pictures for your families. And also with the pictures, and Nancy is updating the directory. Um, so try to get your updates in for those. Uh, if you have new addresses or phone numbers, change. Also, if there's an interest in Chili Willy Days, we usually have that in the fall, but uh, I guess they want to do it in the, in the middle of winter. If there's an interest for Chili Willy Days, get with Aunt and Kim on that. There's a ladies' retreat. February 24th and 25th. Um, the 
topic is soul pampering with the Almighty. Not sure what that means, but I'm sure the ladies will have a good time with that. <laughs> it, what's it? Anchorage Church, yes. Um, let's see. Don't forget the Alaska Lectureship, April 7th, 8th, and 9th. Get your um, surveys in to see where, you, where you'd like to help. Get that to Nancy for those items. We have Steve Teamer for the song leader next week and Paul Bouquet for the in charge of the table. And for cleanup for the potluck, we'd like to welcome all the visitors for that potluck also. It's a good fellowship for the family. The Pruitts, Reichels, Shrams, and the Scots have cleanup for that. And you're dismissed. Thank you. Yes. Get All right, don't forget all the small groups. Thank you.